So while I assume your computers are still humming along trying to get stuff installed, let's uh, begin with a couple of announcements. Um, so uh, we're going to go to the Army Corps of Engineers on Tuesday, November 7th. Sorry, I meant to add the actual day on there, but uh, I mentioned it already in the email I sent you last week. So Tuesday, November 7th, and um, so that we have enough time to actually have a meaningful visit with them, they asked that we meet in the lobby at 9 a.m. So I looked at your course schedules, and I didn't notice anybody who had class starting at 8 o'clock. So is uh, a 9 a.m. arrival going to pose a special inconvenience or uh, imposition on anyone, or can we all be there at 9? The parking's not so good down by the federal building, so you may want to give yourself a little bit of extra time. I plan to try for a spot on the street, but you never can tell exactly. So, All right, so 9 a.m. Uh, Tuesday. It's a week from today on the 7th. Uh, the other thing is uh, a week from today is this next homework assignment. So I printed off a copy of that, and it's also available as a PDF online. Here you go. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be going over today, some of the demos, will help you to know how to do the first problem where you're asked to download some soil types and take a look at the underlying data. Uh, today's class is going to be two parts. One is we're going to be looking at some of the data that gets used during watershed modeling to generate curve numbers. We've been talking about curve numbers. But we haven't really gone into the nuts and bolts of how you would um, assess a curve number for a given watershed. Uh, and then once we go uh, through that demo of soil type and land use, then we'll focus on the NRCS method for unit hydrographs. Before we start on that, are there any questions? Yeah? Uh, sure. Yep. Other questions? All right. So um, you've already, I hope, downloaded Google Earth Pro. And what we're going to do is uh, use it to import shape files and also a specialized raster image. And another thing that we're going to be looking at today is a service of the USDA called Web Soil Survey. And we're going to compare two different types of data sets that they've got there. Um, so just to begin with, let's go to the Web Soil Survey. And if you go to... Uh, Let's see, do I have Google Chrome on here? No? Okay, I'll be using Edge, I suppose. Okay, just do a Google search for Web Soil Survey, and it'll take you right to the landing page of the National Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. That's the division of the USDA that studi studies soil science, and they come up with the hydrologic soil group classification, which is the main thing that we're interested in. So is everybody with me? Do I need to pause or stall while your computer catches up? Let me know if you get to a point where you're falling immeasurably behind and need a moment to collect yourself. All right, so click on the green button there, Start Web Soil Survey. All right, so uh, there are some tabs across the top here that, roughly speaking, is the workflow that you would go through if you want to understand the soil data for a given area. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to try and uh, zoom in on an area of interest. And let's say that we want to get some data um, for the vicinity of Milton, West Virginia. So you can zoom in just using uh, these zoom tools, or you can use this define AOI by rectangle. And so do that. Here, this AOI means area of interest, and we'll define it by drawing a rectangle around the tri-state area. And it'll, oh, too big, I suppose. I probably better zoom in a little bit then. Zoom in a little bit first. All right, I'll zoom in on Cabell County. OK, so let's see if it'll let us define the area of interest now. Uh, we want to select an area that's just north of Milton, although the exact location doesn't necessarily matter too much because 
you know, out in the rural areas, there's going to be and pretty much the same soil types, whether we're a little to the left or a little to the right north of Milton. But you can see what it's done here is it's specified a location, and uh, it starts to bring up a variety of properties. If I switch to the soil map, it's going to tell me about what's in that area of interest. I'll point out one thing, and that is you can define an area of interest going through the scrolling and zooming tools. But another way to set an area of interest is to import a file. And so see here where it says import AOI? Um, there is a zip file in MU Online that is specifying a, a certain area of interest that I'd like you to use for the homework assignment. And so for the homework assignment, you can go to MU Online, get that zip file, and then uh, create the AOI from a zip shape file. The one that I've put on there is .zip extension. So that's what you'll do on the homework. Uh, for our purposes, let's go over to the soil map tab. Now that we've specified some location that we want to know things about. And you'll notice that what it's done now is it's created a, a table of the different soil types within this area of interest. And there are symbols corresponding to uh, certain descriptions. And you can also see a relative percentage of the area of interest. And so already, one of the nice things about this online tool is that it gives you an idea of the relative abundance of different types of soil. And so if you click on one of these names, it'll bring up the details associated with, in this case, chagrin, silt, loam, 0 to 3 percent slopes, occasionally flooded. And uh, it has a lot of information. Some of this data is about you know, the type of information that farmers might be interested in for growing crops. So you can see the number of days that that soil would be frost free, uh, typical temperatures. Um, but if you scroll down a little bit, it also gives some of the breakdown of um, at certain depth, uh, the soil classification of sand versus clay versus loam. and so. This could be useful if we wanted to understand a little bit more about the hydraulic conductivity or perhaps the capacity of the soil for infiltration. Um, if you scroll down further, uh, here's the capacity of the most living layer to transmit water. So again, we have here uh, a, a general idea of the infiltration capacity of the soil. But the most important thing for me when I'm doing a hydrologic model is this hydrologic soil group. So here you can see it's classified as soil group B. And what you'll remember from the curve number tables that we've looked at is that there are usually four columns for each particular uh, land use. And those four columns are on the left side A, which is corresponding to the sandy soils that have a higher infiltration and therefore a lower curve number. And then on the right side of the table would be more plastic and clay soils that swell and have lower infiltration and so higher curve numbers. In this case, we've got a soil group B, which you know, is pretty good uh, for out in these areas where more commonly we're going to see soil group C. So try that out. You can click on some of these other locations. And, uh, and if you look at the map itself, you'll notice that these polygons seem to uh, follow some of the, uh, the physical characteristics of the land. And, and so what I mean by that is this chagrin silt loam, it's following here the, uh, the creek. And so the fact that we had a uh, soil group B, I think is probably consistent with the fact here that you know, sediments are going to wash into the creek bed. and so there may be better infiltration in the creek than if we go up into uh, maybe up on a higher plane or a ridgeline area. So let's look at this GUD, Gilpin Upshore Complex, 15 to 25 percent slope. So you click on that, it'll bring up its characteristics, and this is hydrologic soil group C. So it's going to be a little bit more resistant to infiltration than the uh, than the soils that are right in the creek bed. And so when you look at the density of these polygons, it may give you a lot of confidence that it's a pretty high resolution data source. And in some ways it is. 
but you need to think about how was this generated. And uh, there wasn't a scientist who went through and was digging soil samples every 100 meters. It's not like they did a grid and mapped out the exact um, curvature of you know, delineating this gill pin upshore complex. I mean, how do you think they defined the curves of those soil types? Any guesses? Okay. Elevation? Yeah, it is, uh, it, it is based a little bit on sampling. But what they do is they would sample in a certain location. So you'll notice here where it's giving the descriptions of slopes. So they would sample um, at maybe a ridge line. And they'd see what kind of soils are at the top of a slope. And then everywhere that is a ridge line, they would assign that same type of soil in that area. Or in the, uh, in the creek bed, you know, at the low point of a watershed, they'd sample the soil there. And then every place else that's also at the low point, they would um, assign it the same soil type. And so these uh, are largely extrapolated based on the physical characteristics of um, of the, uh, of the slopes, proximity to creeks, proximity to uh, the, top of the, um, the top of the peaks elevation-wise. And so you know, it's nice to have high density of these polygons because we want to have as much information as possible to get an accurate curve number, but you don't want to get a false sense of security about the accuracy of the data. So that's just one point I wanted to make. Um, you can see this blue arrow here identify. So if you click on that identify and then click on a certain location within the, uh, within the area of interest, then it will bring up some details about that location, the date of the aerial photography, the uh, abbreviation for the map, uh, unit symbol, location of it. Um, All right, now, once you have an area of interest defined like that, then you can download the soil data. And uh, here on the Download Soils Data tab, if you click that, then um, here it'll create a download link. And the nice thing about this, in contrast to in the past, um, we've used some data sets where it assembles the data and it sends you an email when it's ready. Do you remember that? This kind of just does it on the fly, so you're not waiting for uh, uh, your weather data to be built and eventually downloaded. Uh, you'll see here's the download link now. So you could click on that and save it. Uh, be sure that you know the location it gets saved to so that you can open it up later. Sometimes it can be a struggle to, to identify exactly where it's been saved. So if you open up that archive file that you've downloaded and extract it, so you unzip it from the archive, there's going to be a number of files inside of there. Um, the one that we're going to try and open up in Google Earth Pro is the uh, shape file that will be in this spatial folder. Well, let me pause for a moment just to make sure that everybody's downloaded the data successfully. Okay, um, so one of the things I like about Google Earth Pro, besides the fact that it's free, is that you can view shape files. And uh, there are some expensive programs for dealing with shape files and a couple of pretty lame viewers, but Google Earth Pro is a nice compromise. And so let's see if we can open up that area of interest and overlay it onto some mapping data to see uh, how it lines up with the topography there. So let's uh, import, and instead of a text or CSV file, change it over to Esri Shape, and then browse to the location where you've got that data stored. So it should be in the spatial folder. And you'll notice there's a number of shape files there. The one that we want is the biggest of them. So the, the way to know exactly which one is look at their size. 
and several of them are one kilobytes. We're going to open up the one that's 130 kilobytes in my case. Yours may be slightly different. So uh, when you open that, the style template thing, it doesn't matter either way, yes or no. All right, and uh, once you've gone through the dialog here, it'll zoom in. The strange thing is, by default, it wants to look at it at an angle, and then you turn it on. Oh, I should have said no to the style template. I'm going to delete that and open it again. All right, I'm going to import it again. It's time to say no to the, soil, uh, the style template. when I was looking at it earlier. There we go. My style template before was all white, which isn't real helpful, but <laughs> this, if you toggle it on and off, you can see that, all right, for instance, here we have a flat area that is uh, farmland. You know, most of the time we've got these hills that you can't do much with, but um, we can uh, see a pretty good correlation between the physical features and, you know, you can especially tell that if you have the terrain turned on and then you sort of pivot around, you can get a sense for where are the high points and where are the low points in a watershed and kind of compare that to these soil types. Now, um, the main thing that we would want to extract from these soil types is the hydrologic soil group. So when we're going to be using watershed processors in a couple of weeks, WMS, all of the data that is uh, in the soil map tab, all of it is irrelevant except for the hydrologic soil group. And that hydrologic soil group is uh, in, in a tabular file that we're going to have to remember to link. And so here are all these properties of the polygons, and it's the hydrologic soil group that is the one key property that we're going to have to make sure gets mapped over. Um, all right, so the uh, next thing we're going to take a look at on the, uh, on the web soil survey, if you go to download soil data, there was another option here for what we were getting is Sergo. You know, that's what we just downloaded. It's a high resolution data set. There's another, res uh, another data set that's not quite as high resolution for soil type. It's StatsGo. And StatsGo hasn't gone through the same kind of uh, sophisticated extrapolation that depends on slopes and where are creeks and where are ridge lines. It's just kind of like in each region they've picked out one soil that is kind of the predominant soil type in that area, rather than trying to break it down into a finer understanding. So let's download and, and overlay, see if we can also open up the uh, StatsGo map. It's on a state-by-state -state basis, though. You, rather than specifying an area of interest, you'd get the entire StatsGo for West Virginia. So let's see if we can scroll down and find the West Virginia soil map. And you have an idea that these are not super high resolution by the size of these downloads. Like the entire state of West Virginia is only going to be 5.2 megabytes. And so that is not an enormous amount of uh, geospatial data. Open it and we'll extract again. I'm going to extract it to the temp folder that I've been using. And the reason why we're going through this is that the, the pre-processes for hydrologic models have become so good that nowadays it's not required to go and assemble your data sets manually. Um, in the past, when you're creating a watershed, the modeler would have to go to one website to get elevation data, another to import soil type, another to get land use, and you kind of gathered all the data from its original sources and therefore you had an idea of what it was based on and what its limitations were. But nowadays, in a push for in increased convenience, what they've done is they've made it so where you basically just click a button 
and the watershed software will go and automatically get the data from the various servers and assemble it for you. And so you're not actually getting as much detailed uh, metadata on you know, what year that data was uh, assembled, what its resolution, what its limitations are, and so on. So uh, you know, the reason we're going through this is I just want you to be familiar with the origin of the different options that are available to you. All right, so let's do that same thing. Let's import another shape file. This time it's going to be the uh, stats go, which is low resolution, rather than the surgo, which was high resolution. So I'm going to import a shape file, but this time let's uh, browse to the low res folder. And it's again going to be the shape file in the spatial folder. If you open that, I'm going to say no to the style template because I didn't like what it did before. And then turn it on. Okay, so let's zoom in on the tri-state again. And for some reason, it's looking at it at an angle. So you can use the center button. If you push down on the center button, then you can uh, adjust you know, whether you're looking down from above or look, looking at an angle. But all right, these are the, uh, the same areas. And so, you know, they're saying, here's the river. It's one soil type underneath the river. Here's another on the floodplain. We're starting to get up into the hills, um, you know, north of Cabell County. And so, you know, comparing the resolution, let's go to the exact location and toggle between them. So StatsGo is this. This is StatsGo, low resolution soil data, where they haven't bothered to uh, look too much at the terrain. Whereas Surgo, on the other hand, uh, relies heavily on an understanding of what types of soils will accumulate on different types of slopes. All right, so everybody understands StatsGo versus Surgo. They should have come up with more different names than that, because it's hard to remember which is which, right? All right. Um, the next thing we're going to take a look at, now that we've gotten a taste of some of the soil data that's available, um, let's go to the National Land Cover Database. And to begin with, we'll go to, rather than downloading it, I'll show you. This is a site where you could get the entire United States in a single 1.1 gigabyte file. And we won't bother to download the entire US. There's a different spot where you can just uh, grab sections of it, snipped out sections. But um, let's say if you were writing a paper and you wanted to cite the National Land Cover Database or you wanted to understand a little bit more about their methodology, this is the website that has all of the details about um, how this data is generated and who did it and uh, so this is the main you know, product web page but the place that we are actually going to download it from is called the National Map Viewer so again uh, let's do a Google search for National Map Viewer and this is a really great resource and you know in the the bad old days when I had to walk uphill to school both directions and uh, in the snow. After doing that, you'd get to school and you'd have to download, like I was just saying, your, uh, your data for watershed modeling from so many different websites. And, you know, one website would change and you'd have trouble finding what you're looking for. Well, nowadays they've got the, uh, the National Map Viewer. Um, this is the advanced viewer. I don't know that I've seen the advanced viewer before. I better go to the normal viewer. <laughs> I'm not advanced. All right, download GIS data is what I'm going to be <coughs> trying for. Basic, yes, that's what I like, basic. All right. <coughs> so zoom in on uh, West Virginia. And uh, over here on the left side, you can see the different products that are available. And so you could get the topographic maps, you could get elevation data, uh, you can get uh, aerial photography in the form of this imagery. 
Um, the National Land Cover Database is part two of the two things that defines a curve number. Remember, a curve number is land use and soil type. Your computer froze up? Yeah. GIS, download GIS data. You got it? Okay. So zoom in on West Virginia and um, maybe the, uh, the simplest way to uh, specify a location is here in the advanced search tools. We'll just type in uh, West Virginia. I think Oh, product category. Let's do National Land Cover Database, and we'll look at the 2011. You'll notice that they issue a new National Land Cover Database <coughs> every five years. And that's a really powerful thing, the fact that this is updated, uh, because it allows you to track development over time and do an analysis on how curve numbers in a watershed maybe have changed over time. And so. You know, if you've got a watershed that's flooding a lot and people say, well, it didn't used to be like this, you can go and get the land uses from 2001 or even back beyond that. If you go straight to the, uh, to the website itself, I think they've got archived uh, land covers before that. But you could calculate a curve number in the past, and I would imagine that probably the 2016 edition will be posted hopefully soon since we're almost at 2018. Uh, but, all right, so let's select the 2011 search for West Virginia, and I know they've got the state version of West Virginia because I got it yesterday. Uh, all right, so data extent, let's select state, find products. All right, there we go, West Virginia. Okay, so what I did again was under data sets, National Land Cover Database, choose the 2011, and then data extent state. All right, so then once you execute the search here under products, there's going to be a couple of options. You can see that it's got the uh, tree canopy percentage, the percent developed, but the main one that we're going to want is the, uh, the one at the top, I think, just the normal 2011 edition National Land Cover. Okay, so we're going to download that. It's going to be a pretty big download, so hopefully this doesn't take too long. Uh, it doesn't. It's pretty fast. Interesting, did you notice that download was coming from Amazon? Even though this is the, uh, a government website, I think they're using Amazon for their web hosting. Kind of interesting. All right, so if you open that up, it's going to be a zip file that we have to extract. And um, there's going to be a TIFF in there, which is a tagged image file format. It's basically an uncompressed raster file. And there will also be a JPEG in there that we can view more easily. But it's going to uh, expand out once you unarchive it to quite a bit bigger than the size of the original download. Our original download, I think, was around 30 megabytes. You'll notice uh, here in the, which one was it? Where'd it go? Oh, I think it, it did it all in the root of here. So here's the NLCD. Uh, 173 megabytes for that TIFF file. Uh, the JPEG we could open up, and it's just, uh, it's got a world file, which is a way of assigning coordinates to the edges of a JPEG image so that it would overlay on top of a, um, on, a, on top of a map. So first we'll open up that JPEG just to get a, a look at it, but it's really the TIFF that we're going to be more interested in opening, and we'll do that in Google Earth. But open up the JPEG. And you'll see that it looks like the state uh, paint, I think, will be fine. 
All right, so here's the state of West Virginia and lots of different colors. I think this is already looking at 100% scale, though, so we couldn't zoom in too much further. The, uh, the TIFF is at an even higher resolution, but what are you noticing so far about, and you know a little bit about the geography of the state, what do you suppose red means? Remember, this is a, an image file that corresponds to land use. Imperviousness. Now, the land use, uh, that's a good guess. Yeah, impervious. So the, you're, you're thinking the red parts are, Im, are impervious, and you're right, indirectly. Uh, red means like developed areas. So let me pull up a land use table. Um, because these different land uses correspond to the type of assignments. Here we go. I'm going to open up a curve number table with a notepad. All right. Each one of those colors is assigned a number. Like, probably the red is going to be uh, in the 20s. Developed open space, developed low intensity, developed medium intensity, developed high intensity. Uh, 11 is open water. And so this map is each color is assigned another, uh, is assigned a certain number. And so the open water is blue in this picture. And so that's category 11. Um, Probably a light pink would be the developed low intensity. Red would be developed medium or high intensity. Uh, here, what do you know about these regions that are in yellow? What's in this part of the state of West Virginia? The mountains, right? This is the, this is the high part of the state in the yellow here. And so that's going to be probably um, where we've got more evergreen forest dominating instead of the deciduous forests. And so what we were looking at earlier from the USDA site was hydrologic soil group. And so that's what defines A, B, C, D. You'll notice each one of the rows here has a set of four numbers afterwards. And they corresponds, it, it corresponds to soil group A, B, C, and D. And then this picture that we're looking at is what specifies which row you're on. Uh, in trying to define what's the curve number. And so let's open up the more uh, higher resolution a TIFF file using Google Earth. This will be real fortunate if we can get it to open because it's going to be, you know, it's a big file. So open the, uh, switch it to all files and browse to the location of where you have that TIFF. And I'm going to open up where was that big TIFF? Here it is, West Virginia. It's, mine was 173. I think we'll all have the same size. We all downloaded the same file, right? So 173 megabytes, and it should give us some sort of a warning message about if we want to uh, scale it or something. So it flies us to the, okay, so um, let's, I did crop this warning, and it seemed to work okay. So crop and then crop in, uh, I lost my chance, I did a bad thing. I think I clicked outside of the state. Right, I'm gonna import it again. There it is, that big tiff, okay. This time I'm just gonna tell it to scale rather than crop and it, it'll take 20 or 30 seconds to, to go through the scale. Oh, okay, there it is. So there's the high resolution version. Uh, boy, high resolution, I guess, is relative. Let's try that one more time. I'm not, I'm not real happy with quality. I'm going to delete that. And import it one more time. I'll open. There it is. Okay, 
this time I'm going to try um, the prop again. Pick a center. Uh, right there. Okay, yeah, there we go. That's, that's more like it. So you can see now the, uh, the individual pixels. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is to um, help you understand the difference between a raster and a vector. Um, if you've done much photography before, you probably know what a bitmap is, right? A bitmap is basically a collection of pixels where uh, a picture is just um, a sensor that is able to identify the color in a grid system. And so that's, this is a raster or a bitmap or land use. And so you can see here in the uh, US 60 corridor of Milton, that's where there's more development. And then you go south of Milton, there's a river there. And so this brown is probably a floodplain. And so this is a raster. But if now we uh, look at, turn off the, uh, these are not rasters. These are vectors or um, shape files, where if you zoom in, it doesn't start to get really pixelated because the location of this line is what's defining the shape of the polygon, rather than this polygon being defined by blocky pixels. So the National Land Cover Database, one of the limiting factors is that um, the scale of these pixels, if I'm not mistaken, it's 100 meters by 100 meters. And so it's pretty good. Depending on the size of your watershed, it may be plenty. But if you have a really small watershed, or if you're trying to um, to figure out what's the curve number in a complicated urban area, then you may need to sort of manually override the curve numbers that it automatically generates because, because of the spatial resolution of this data being 100 meters by 100 meters. The elevation data that we're going to be working with is usually 10 meters by 10 meters. And so that'll be plenty of resolution considering how uh, hilly it is in our neck of the woods here in West Virginia. 10 meter resolution will be, will be plenty. But any questions about land use, soil type? And this is really where the rubber meets the road, where you're combining hydrologic soil group with land use and getting the curve number from that. You'll see next week when we start with WMS how it automatically does this. And back when we were having to kind of take a guess at what the runoff coefficient C value might be, that's always an uncomfortable feeling when you're doing calculations and you're telling a client to you know, size a pipe based on some assumption you made. Oh, I'll assume the C value is 0.65. And they say, well, why wasn't it 0.5? I and mean, I don't know. Engineering judgment, that's why. But uh, this is. Uh, a lot less uncomfortable because there's si sort of a methodology and really high quality data sets behind generating the curve numbers. So, all right. So now that we've had that kind of preview of where it's all going to be coming from, let's look at one of the ways that we actually generate a runoff hydrograph. So thus far with the NRCS method, in the quiz that you, you just got back, I asked you to figure out the runoff depth. So P sub E in that formula that you used on the quiz was the runoff depth or the rainfall excess. Based on a curve number for a watershed, you calculated the storage. And then based on the precipitation depth and the storage, you found out the runoff amount that there's going to be. The next part of the NRCS method, sometimes this is called the SCS unit hydrograph method. And SCS stands for Soil Conservation Service. And that was just the precursor uh, agency to the NRCS. Nowadays, the NRCS is the National Resource Conservation Service. Uh, I guess resource conservation is more broad than soil conservation. In any case, uh, since this unit hydrograph method was developed back in the SCS days, then often it's still called the SCS method. There's a curved linear hydrograph here that in some ways is similar to the Snyder's synthetic unit hydrograph. And you remember that when you did the Snyder method, what you were uh, looking at was the basin characteristics to figure out 
how long the lag time was going to be between when it was a precipitation and when you saw the peak. Um, in this case, the advantage of the SCS unit hydrograph method is instead of just having a triangular hydrograph, they've kind of taken the more typical shape of a runoff hydrograph where there is um, a gradual increase and then it starts slowing down a little bit. The rainfall intensity starts decreasing and so as the peak approaches, there's a tapering, a little bit of a plateau at the top and then the point of inflection. And so it's a more realistic shape. And um, the other advantage here to the SCS method is that computing the lag time has more of a um, more of a connection to the actual physical characteristics of a watershed that can be measured. And so this lag time method here uses the hydraulic length of a watershed. And you'll notice here that the units are in feet. This is an empirical, method, empirical uh, equation, but it's using things that actually can be directly measured either by hand or by the uh, watershed model that you're going to be using. And so uh, it also is using S, which is related to the curve number. Remember the watershed storage. And then the, uh, the slope in percent. And the way that this works is uh, instead of, like if it was a 3% slope, you'd put the number 3 in for y. You wouldn't do 0.03. So the units here are important. Um, but once you calculate the lag time, then this entire curve is kind of just based on the lag time and the um, overall depth at a certain point is going to be relative to the peak. And so just to illustrate how this all works, let's um, do an example here. Uh, one other thing I wanted to tell you about is that the, uh, there's a peaking factor that's also based in, in addition to the uh, curve number. The, um, the overall peak runoff can depend on uh, slope characteristics and how urbanized a watershed is. And so we're going to use this typical SCS peaking factor of 484, but if you have an urban area, you can increase the amount and sort of raise the peak of that runoff even further beyond the, that which is predicted by the lag time. Or if you have rural areas that are flat and the water is going to be moving slower, it's kind of just a, a way to additionally correct for the slow moving water. Um, but here's an example that uh, we have a certain watershed with a curve number that we've calculated. And uh, we want to find the unit hydrograph peak discharge. And so that means using this curve and that Excel file that you downloaded is the digitization of this curve. And so rather than having you type it in or you know, here's the tabular version of it, um, the discharge ratios just say that we can calculate the peak discharge and then all of the points on the hydrograph are based to this peak discharge that comes at uh, time, the ratio of time to time to peak of 1.0. And so uh, you'll notice in the file that I've given you here, there's the time ratio column and the discharge ratio column. So on the example, what we're going to do, first of all, is uh, for the curve number, find out what's the time of concentration going to be based on the lag time. And then once you know the time of the lag time and the time of concentration, you can find the time to peak. And then you can use this equation to find the peak discharge per unit of rainfall excess. And then you can find the flow rate at a certain time with the time ratios. So basically, uh, start by calculating the uh, the S, the storage, based on the curve number, and then everything follows from there. Now, one caution, the hydraulic length that's given of 1.2 miles, remember that the units of L should be in feet. So you're going to have to convert that 1.2 miles over to feet before you put it into the lag time formula.
Okay, so what we're calculating is how much runoff there's going to be per unit of rainfall excess here. So the Q in this peak formula, the Q is basically the same thing as the P sub E that we've been calculating in the SCS method. It just means how much runoff excess is there. And so if we assume an inch of rainfall excess, then what this tells us is that the peak is going to be 1992 CFS per inch of rainfall excess. So then, once we have that calculated, then we can go to the um, spreadsheet file and come up with the actual runoff hydrograph, just based on the, that curve that's digitized. So we said our T sub P that we calculated was 0. 729, and that's hours. And then the uh, Q sub P is uh, 1992, and that's CFS per inch for the units of that, inch of rainfall excess. And so um, then this column we can calculate time in hours by simply multiplying the time ratio by our time to peak. And then what we should see is that at 1 is the time to peak in hours. And then this is going to be discharge in CFS per inch of rainfall excess. So we multiply the curve by the amount that we calculated as our peak, and then drag that through. And here you can see the 1992 at the point that we know is going to be our peak. So then you can insert a curve of that and take a look at what the actual runoff hydrograph looks like. Okay, so let's put in some data. X values would be the time. Well, we know our time to peak. We calculated that using uh, you know, this approach. We found the time to peak was 0.729 hours. So then for the time column, it's just going to be the time to peak multiplied by the time ratios. So you'll notice here when the time, the, the time ratio means a certain time relative to the time to peak. And the same thing is true for this discharge. The discharge ratio means that it's a fraction of, you know, when is a certain amount relative to the amount that you'll see at the peak. Okay, so for the, uh, for the discharge then,
So we started with the watershed where we knew a little bit of information. We knew what the curve number of the watershed was. We knew the area. We knew how long the stream was, the main stream, uh, the slope. And these are all things that can be easily assessed just using um, data you can download from uh, USDA and from the USGS and then process to find these characteristics of how long is the stream and what's the average slope um, using a calculator to find the curve number. And then we said for a certain amount of rainfall excess, you know, when is the peak going to be? And so this is telling us it's going to peak relatively quickly, and it's a fairly small watershed. You know, in the grand scheme of things, a watershed that has an area of three square miles is pretty small. Um, so. That is the, uh, the SES unit hydrograph method. So that's sort of what it's, what's going to be working in the background. Um, I, I don't want us to jump into the watershed modeling and just sort of take everything on faith. I want you to be acquainted with where the data comes from, you know, what are the calculations that it's doing. And it's really nice to have it available to automate those calculations so you don't have to do things manually. Uh, especially, let me show you a watershed model that I just created on uh, Friday for a project that I'm doing in Somaliland you know, over in Africa. <laughs> um, let me see if I can open that up. And you'll get an idea of why um, watershed modeling uh, tools that automate the process can be so beneficial. Because it's easy to do this for a single watershed, but when you have to break the watershed down into smaller areas, then it can get really complicated. This watershed that I'm working with is uh, about 200 square miles in Somaliland in Africa. Um, and you'll see that I've broken that watershed down into lots of little sub-basins. And the reason why is that this method, of uh, the SCS method, has an upper limit of 19 square miles. And so um, the area that we calculated over here, let's see, where the, yeah. So you see in this formula where we put in area of three square miles, in the literature, it says that 19 square miles is probably an upper limit for how accurate this is going to be. So if you have a watershed that's larger than 19 square miles, like one that's about 200 square miles, then what you have to do is you have to break it down into little pieces, and then you have to uh, combine the pieces together. And so in, in this watershed model, if I had to manually calculate like we did on the board here, for each one of these sub-basins, what is the time of concentration, uh, what is the uh, hydrograph look like, and then this model also is taking into account how long the delay is as the water flows through the stream from one outlet to the next. And so we're going to be combining the, out, the, the hydrograph from one watershed with the travel time and then the runoff from the watershed that's downstream of it. And everything kind of, let me see if I can run the model real quick. Hopefully I'll get lucky and it won't crash, just so you can see. All right, well, I'll run it three times. This is, this is a scenario where there's four, four inches of rain and then I'm just testing to see different curve numbers, like what if the average curve number is 65, 70, or 75. And so if I run that model once, twice, a third time, then we'll get these hydrographs from it. You see there's a hydrograph for each one of the sub-basins, and here's the main outlet. And so it executed that model really easily and simply. Um, and this is a big watershed with a pretty big storm coming through it. But you can see the range of, you know, if you have a small watershed, 65 curve number versus 70 versus 75. But 
Uh, having to do that manually would take days, if not weeks, of calculations, but automating the process makes it a lot simpler. But there's just so many options available to you when you're actually doing the uh, watershed modeling, like so many different ways that you can calculate the time of concentration that it's important to know what's going on in the background. So. Uh, download WMS. I've given you the license code that you're going to need to be able to activate it. If you have any trouble with that, please let me know. I'd like for you to have that installed. Um, I don't think that we'll use it on Thursday, but we'll use it a week from Thursday. So ne next Tuesday we're going to be at the Army Corps of Engineers, so the class after that next week is when we'll start to work with WMS. Um, any questions about this example? All right. Well, that's all for today. Let's just take one last look at these announcements here. You've got the uh, homework assignment, number nine I've just given you. I'll put the solutions to homework seven and eight on MU Online today, so you can take a look at those. Have a nice day. I'll see you on Thursday.